most of my life, if I were to describe it in a lay person's way, I'd say most of my life, I was deeply, truly unhappy. In other words, I was perfectly unaware of the innate and intrinsic and inherent happiness that existed within myself and all of us at all points in time. I mean, that's why I was depressed and suicidal, you know, for so long. This episode is brought to you by three books, Happiness from the Inside Out, Love from the Inside Out, and as always, the book Conversations, How to Manage Your Business Relationships One Conversation at a Time by yours truly, Ivan Farber. All three books are available on Amazon and Kindle. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Conversations About Conversations. If you're someone who wants to be a more effective leader and be inspired by others' examples, this show is for you. We talk with movers, shakers, and difference makers about the important and meaningful conversations that they lead in the world. Our guests are business leaders, authors, speakers, podcasters, coaches, and more. We're building a community of conversation leaders. What is a conversation leader, you might be asking? Well, quite simply, you are. You're leading conversations every day, all day long. And what I want to encourage you to ask yourself is, what are the conversations I'm leading? How effective am I at leading them? Why am I leading them? And whom am I leading conversations for? Now, today's conversation leader is Coach Robert Mack. Now, Robert is a positive psychology expert. He's an executive and celebrity happiness coach. He's the author of the books, Happiness from the Inside Out, The Art and Science of Fulfillment, and also Love from the Inside Out, Lessons and Inspiration for Loving Yourself, Your Life, and Each Other. But wait, there's more. In addition to serving as a celebrity love coach for Famously Single on E! Network for two seasons, he also worked as a consulting producer and on-camera expert for Oprah Winfrey and executive producer and host of Good Morning La La Land on Apple TV and Hulu. He's been featured on television shows like Good Morning America, Today Show, CBS Morning Show, Access Hollywood, and now, for the first time ever, Conversations About Conversations. Robert is one of the most exciting, engaging, and extraordinary coaches and speaker in the world today. But all of this is not what impresses me most about Rob. In preparation for this conversation, I listened to 20 interviews, and what impresses me most is the quality of his ideas and the quality of his conversations. So please help me welcome Robert Mack. Rob, welcome. Oh my goodness, thanks for having me. I just more, more, more. <laughs> that was so great, Ivan. Mean, I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate you inviting me into the conversation. Well, there's definitely more coming. But before more comes, I want to give you the opportunity, since I've done all the speaking so far, to make an opening statement. And I'd like to hear in your words the answer to this question. What are the conversations that you're leading? Hmm. Often silent ones. You know, I think the highest teaching is and happens through silence, right? There's silent transmissions. Uh, I think it's um, easy for lots of us, and um, I'm the poster boy for this probably most of my life, to try to teach through words what can only truly be taught through presence and by living the truth instead of just talking about it, instead of just preaching it. And so uh, being the change, I think is where I always want to start. And that's um, a state of being and not just a matter or manner of talking, right? So for me, that's where it starts is doing the inner work in a way that allows me to show up and be the conversation or be the communication in a way that um, I can then follow up with words. Who, since we get to invent anything and things are invented in language, who do we want to be in this conversation? Hmm. I think whoever we are, whoever we are, whatever shows up is, um, I think, to be loved and welcomed and celebrated. I would say that um, at the best, at my best, I get out of the way and I let whatever comes through, come through, you know? So the real conversation um, or the real work to be done often happens in advance of this formal conversation, right? So uh, yeah, at the at my best, I'm a microphone, 
a ballpoint pen, you know, a megaphone, maybe, maybe uh, an empty hollow bamboo shoot or a flute uh, for a deeper, wiser, sort of more timeless and transcendental message, I think. Ultimately, uh, it doesn't need to be or sound that complicated. It could be very simple. Uh, but I think, yeah, for me, that's what it's about. I don't want to recreate all of the interviews we've already done. So having watched or listened to 20 interviews, I want to do something different. And instead of a conversation for how to be happy, what makes people unhappy? Yeah. So it depends on who you ask. Uh, and it depends on when you ask them. I'd say that most people would tell you that what makes them most unhappy or unhappy at all is other people, conditions, circumstances, places, and activities, right? Um, I'd say that's ultimately it. So let's say it's health or lack thereof and money and lack thereof and relationships and lack thereof and um, education and lack thereof. And so all of these circumstances and conditions, people, places, activities um, that make them unhappy. And I'd say they're not wrong. Um, there's a deeper, truer answer. And I'd say that it's mostly an overthinking, overanalytical, obsessively compulsively thinking mind that obscures the innate and intrinsic and inherent happiness that exists within and as all of us. So it's mostly, if not entirely, overthinking. Yes. It's the thinking. Yes. Why is happiness important for success in life and business? Yeah, it's, it's the reason we strive for success in life and business. It's the reason we aim for wisdom or health or beauty. It's ultimately the greatest good. That's number one, is that all success strives for happiness. And yet no success can deliver or guarantee or provide happiness. And so that's why, you know, first and foremost, um, then more than that. And so in other words, it's a feeling we're ultimately after. That's a, not a perfectly accurate way of expressing it. It's a concession to language, but we're ultimately after a feeling. You might call that feeling peace or love or happiness or contentment or abundance or success. But the second reason is, is that in addition to feeling good, which is the point of it all, when you feel good first, life gets better second. And so the happier you are, the happier the circumstances tend to be around you and the conditions around you, the people around you. And so there's something extraordinarily attractive and not in a sort of spiritual platitude or cliched sort of way, but based on decades of research and evidence, we know that the happier you get, the better that life tends to go, not just subjectively, also objectively, right? So it improves and enhances your health and your immune response. It may, helps you to make and save more money. It helps you to get into relationships and stay in relationships and stay in those relationships in a happy way, right? It helps you to prevent job burnout. It helps you to perform at your best. You're more creative. You're a better problem solver. You're about 500 to a thousand percent more effective and efficacious at whatever it is that you happen to be doing at the time when you're in flow state. And so for reasons that are both objective and subjective, uh, happiness is, I'd say, a master key and a pretty good intention to set for yourself. What percent of the time would you say you are happy versus unhappy? 100%. And that's true for everyone. Now, we're not always aware. Wait, 100% unhappy? 100% happy. 100% happy. Yeah, and that's true of everyone. Um, the difference is, and this is the, where the discernment and the little delineation comes in. We're 100% happy. In fact, I'd say we're 100% happiness. But we're not aware of our innate, intrinsic, and inherent happiness 100% of the time. And so what we usually and normally think of as happiness is actually awareness of the pre-existing sort of infinite eternal happiness that exists within and as all of us all the time. And that's why you can have a moment where you feel extraordinarily unhappy, nothing around you changes, nothing inside of you necessarily changes, and you suddenly feel happy, or vice versa, right? That's because this, you're always, essentially, we are all always, sounds so uh, negative, but we're drowning in, we're swimming in, we're flooded by, consumed with happiness. Happiness is really all that exists. But our awareness of that happiness ebbs and flows, it comes and goes. 
it's such a foreign concept for me, Robert. Yes. I have spent, I would say more than 95% of my life unhappy. And I had a conversation with my son recently because he chose a college and he decided it wasn't right the college for him. And he said, dad, I always wanted to be more successful than you. But what I realized is I actually want to be happier than you. And I said, yes, I have spent most of my life being unhappy. And it's not that I don't have a great life. I feel very grateful for the life I have. But I don't spend 100% of my life. But I'm, I, get, I think I get what you mean there because I've watched 20 interviews. And that is, it, I am always happy as a baseline. And then my thinking comes in and makes me unhappy and obfuscates the happiness. Is that's that, right. That's that right. It? Exactly. Yes. Um, I, and I would say in, in another way to say it, uh, not maybe quite as eloquently as you just did, but we're a hundred percent happiness, right? We are essentially happiness. We are essentially love. It's another synonym for happiness. Um, peace is another synonym for happiness. Um, so unless we can get caught up in the language and the semantics, the experience matters more than any particular description or explanation. Uh, but the idea is that we're hundred percent that all the time. And sometimes we're aware that we're that and sometimes we're not aware that we're that. Another word is enlightened. You know, we're hundred, we're enlightened hundred percent of the time. And when we're aware of that enlightenment, we call it enlightenment. When we're unaware of that pre-existing, always existing enlightenment, we call it unenlightened or lack of enlightenment, right? And so a good metaphor for it is like the sunshine, right? There are some days that just seem so gray and overcast and it's rainy and you say, oh, it's just not a sunny day outside. Well, is that true? I mean, the sun is always just right there burning and blazing and heating up the earth in the way that it always has. It hasn't gone anywhere, it's right there. But there's some cloud cover and the cloud cover is obscuring or obfuscating um, you know, your experience or your awareness of the sun and the sunshine that's always there. But at any point in time, you can come back to that recognition that the sun hasn't gone anywhere and the happiness inside you hasn't gone anywhere either. That reminds me of a chapter in Michael Singer's book, The Untethered Soul where he talks about the sunshine being there. And then we create walls to protect us. We get accustomed to the walls. Then we feel unsafe. And then all of a sudden we're like, well, we could put the lights inside. We don't need the light from the sun. So that is what I thought of. And I had a sense that that's a book that, that you'd read as well. Love Michael Singer, you know, uh -huh. a book, great metaphor. That's absolutely it. And sometimes I'd say too, that it seems as though we put our back to the sun because we begin looking for we you know we're, we're convinced that the sun isn't there and so we go we turn our back to the sun and we go then begin looking for sources of light in every other direction right but of course that's ultimately fruitless because the sunshine is always right there and all you got to do is turn around and face it that essentially is what the inner journey is about that's what inner work is about it's what you know all the mystics talk about it's what psychologists and therapists ultimately are aiming at even if we don't always do it you know, in the most accurate or most direct and most efficient way. Um, the point and the purpose is to do an about face, a U-turn and to look within and discover that this eternal sunshine of the spotless mind or this invincible summer that Albert Camus talked about is always right there within you and as you, and it doesn't require you thinking a whole lot different. In fact, the less you think the better, doesn't in fact require you doing a whole lot of things differently. In fact, the less you do, probably the better. Um, but yeah, we're distracted and it's because of a distracted and undisciplined mind that we experience so little happiness. Well, you've changed my life and will change lives of the members of the community and the people that have the privilege of hearing this conversation. And you change it from all the interviews, but also when I, in asking you what percent of the time and you answering hundred percent, you've just given me permission to be happy hundred percent of the time. Mm. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I talked a little bit about this before we came on the air here. I, that's light. That's transformative for me. It's life changing for me to hear that. And I've often struggled to receive 
such generous gifts. So thank you so much for saying and sharing that. And um, to your earlier point, you know, most of my life, if I were to describe it in a lay person's way, I'd say most of my life, I was deeply, truly unhappy. In other words, I was perfectly unaware of the innate and intrinsic and inherent happiness that existed within myself and all of us at all points in time. I mean, that's why I was depressed and suicidal, you know, for so long. And um, it's interesting now that we'd be having this conversation and I feel like, gosh, that seems like so long ago. And yet also just yesterday that I didn't have an awareness of any of this. Um, so things can change pretty quickly. They don't need to, but they can. On Amazon, the description in your book, Happiness from the Inside Out says, happiness from the inside out describes eight tried and true principles for realizing unconditional happiness and achieving unparalleled success that comes with it. Would you be willing to share a few of those eight principles with us? Sure. Uh, see if I can even remember them all <laughs> by name. Um, I certainly remember the concepts. I'd say the first and the most important is the path of least energy investment. Sometimes we may call it the path of non-resistance. It's lazy intelligence is what it is. So it's taking the laziest but smartest path to achieving, accomplishing, acquiring, experiencing whatever it is that you want to achieve, accomplish, acquire, and experience, right? And so it's taking the direct short path to happiness and therefore success and love and health and abundance. And so that's all about stepping all the way back from your life and asking yourself first and foremost, what is this very long life, especially if I'm unhappy or miserable, and also very short life, particularly if I'm happy and having a great time, what's it all for? What's it all about? What's the getting up in the morning and the brushing the teeth and the going to the work and the job and fighting with the relatives or the family or the friends? And, you know, what's all that for? And for me, it's for feeling, the feeling I call happiness and also call it peace or peaceful aliveness. But the first rule and law is to take the path of least energy investment with the laziest, smartest approach to getting what you want. So that's all about going directly to the source for happiness. Right? And so instead of routing your happiness and your peace, your love or your self-love through other people, places and things, you go directly inside yourself for it. You know, you stop waiting and hesitating and procrastinating and postponing this happiness thing or this love thing or this abundance thing or the success thing. And you say, no, I've had enough. I want it right here and right now, which is by the way, the only time and place we can ever have happiness or peace or love. It's here and now. Got it. Would you like to talk about some of the other principles? Yeah. Um, you know, I think ultimately, you know, one of the principles I think that sort of stands out for me the most is just um, a practice of self-appreciation. You know, it's a self-love. And a lot of that, and actually a lot of the other principles can be summed up um, in a very simple sort of phrase, which is learning to tell a better feeling story about yourself, that self-love and self-appreciation, about other people and life itself, we call that love. And about the world in general, we might call that happiness. But telling a better feeling story about yourself, everybody and everything else, but based in truth, right? This is something we're not taught as kids, at least most of us weren't taught, and hopefully it'll increasingly be taught. But the idea is to be your own best friend and to think and talk in ways that supports you in actually achieving, accomplishing, acquiring, and experiencing what you most want to achieve, accomplish, acquire, and experience. But most of us find something or someone or some part of something or someone or ourselves that we dislike, that makes us uncomfortable. And because it's true, we focus on it and we keep focusing on it. And somehow we think that by focusing on the problem, we're gonna find solutions or we're gonna feel better by focusing on what feels worse. But it doesn't work that way. You know, in order to feel and experience happiness, you have to focus on happiness. And if you wanna find solutions, you've gotta be solution oriented. You know, the problem and the solution are on two different pages. Happiness and unhappiness are on two different pages. You simply cannot get east by going west in this particular way, right? In, the, in, in this um, sort of world of trying to discover or rediscover uh, happiness. Happiness from the Inside Out was your first book. Now your second book and more recent book is love from the inside out. It's clear to me that 
you're not exclusively talking about romantic love, but rather love with a capital L. This is a show for business people. How would you extrapolate that to love and business? Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, at the end of the day, in my 20 years of work as an executive coach, the number one theme without question that every professional has always wanted to work on, no matter what else they want to work on, has been executive presence. <laughs> it's executive presence. And when I think about executive presence, I think about the three Ps. The first P is presence itself. That means keeping your mind where your body is, right? So that's the way Vince Vaughn, the actor, describes it. There's an advanced or graduate level to that presence piece of executive presence, which is keeping your mind quiet while your body does what it does. Okay? The other two Ps are positivity on one hand. And so that means starting and ending every conversation, both live and virtual, with positivity, warmth, and rapport building. Extraordinarily, extraordinarily important. When you do that well, you build a bank of goodwill with people that you can then lean on and they'll, with, they'll make withdrawals from throughout the conversation if you say something that's a little off-putting or you get something wrong or you're not as present the entire time. The third P is power. It's really about confidence, right? And so really when you think about it, when you're tapped in, tuned in, turned on, and you're really happy, and you're independently happy, you're unconditionally happy, peaceful, you communicate without any words, all three of those elements of executive presence, you do it easily and effortlessly and enjoyably and, with, and automatically, right? So you're present effortlessly because happiness is presence. You're positive automatically. That's what happiness is. It's a positive experience and a life-affirming experience. And you're extraordinarily deeply confident because you're not concerned about being pushed off balance or off center because you found your balance, you found your center and it's independent of what's happening around you or what other people are or aren't up to. Another way of saying, or describing that positivity is love, that presence is love and that confidence is love. It's both self-love, but it's also love for others. When you no longer need to depend and you no longer outsource or delegate how you feel to other people, you don't need their validation. You don't need their love in order to feel loved or in order to feel love. And you can therefore give away that love easily and effortlessly and without an expectation of reciprocity just because it feels so good, right? And so when you show up in this particular way, you are being not only loving, but love itself as a state of being, right? And then the person says the off-putting thing or they say something that's insulting or offensive and you just smile, it's okay. It doesn't mean you might not feel a little something on the inside when the mind gets in there. But so if you're a business person or a professional, you know, love is really another way of talking about executive presence as is happiness, as is peace. Um, and remember too, love is uh, strong, it's not weak. There's nothing weak about love and that doesn't mean you can't or won't be vulnerable. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the way I think about love and happiness and peace is that these are all synonyms and executive presence. They're ways of talking about the same experience and same energy but through different lenses and with different language. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Yes. I feel that from you, Ivan. I feel that from you, brother. Yeah. And it's, I've had to learn how to take the same side of the table as my prospects or my clients or my managers, but obviously it makes a world, world of difference to approach from love. Robert, I'm really intrigued by your career and I'm going to take a little bit of a, a circle to, to get to what I want to ask you about your career. but. I want to say what's amazing is we got connected by one like, one thumbs up on LinkedIn because I posted a short clip of another guest of mine, Louisa Jewell, who you know through, through Penn. And then all of a sudden, you're liking my stuff. I'm liking your stuff. And then we're starting to see the conversations that each of us are leading and I just find that to be miraculous, actually, that in this world, a like can lead to a relationship, a collaboration. It's, it's a miracle. I have found in all of the posting that I do, you get so little of it. And it's so easy to hit like or make a comment, but like you'll get tens of thousands of views of things and maybe 10 likes. And as someone who has a low self-esteem and has been unhappy most of my life, 
up until now where I'm hundred percent happy. <laughs> um, I'm craving the likes, but I, I recently shifted that around and I just, I'm an aggressive liker because I know how important it is. I'm not the only one with low self-esteem. And what it opens up is relationship and collaboration and conversation. And you know how like you, I used to say, well, I liked it on Instagram, so I probably shouldn't like it on Facebook. And now I'm like, it's getting, li if I liked it one place, I'm liking it every place. Anyway, back to LinkedIn, where we are connected. So in preparation, I looked at your LinkedIn profile, looked at your resume, your career. And I can kind of see it unfold, but I, I don't want to make assumptions here. I want to actually ask you, you spent early on in your career time as a management consultant for Deloitte. What was that like for you? And actually from there, if you would take us through how you got to where you are now as a happiness coach for celebrities and a producer for Oprah and things like that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I fell into management consulting straight out of undergrad because all the smart kids with good grades were interviewing for either investment banking roles or management consulting roles. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I did know that I loved psychology, but I was concerned I wouldn't be able to make enough to survive doing it. And that maybe also I'd get burnt out. Um, and so I interviewed with Deloitte, got the job, hated the job. <laughs> I love the people. I love the company. I hated the job. It was just not a good fit for me for lots of reasons. I really wanted to talk to people about the more intimate details of their, you know, psychology and emotional life, right? So psychological and emotional life. So I did that for several years. And then I remember always thinking, I'm never going to be able to quit this job because it pays too well and it's too well respected and I'm not ready to disappoint other people and, you know, throw my life away is what it kind of felt like. Cause I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't know what I was going to do if I didn't do consulting. So lo and behold, I end up, um, I entered or applied for a uh, business school. Um, and part of it was, um, I wanted to move to Miami and work from a virtual office at a time where working from a virtual office was not really a thing. Um, and the company approved it and I began my MBA program. And not long after that, uh, I remember getting a phone call and they said, you know, at that point I had taken an internal role at the company and they had said, hey, you know, Rob, um, we're calling today. We're going to be outsourcing this part of the organization to, uh, to India. And, uh, you know, you have a choice. You can you know, contemplate, consider moving back into the consulting world or you can find, uh, you know, work somewhere else. And I remember thinking, oh, this is my big break. <laughs> I can find work somewhere else, you know, so in that, in that experience, I thought, well, I'll be able to find a corporate job pretty quickly. At that time, the economy wasn't doing so well, and I was in Miami, and there wasn't a whole lot professionally from a corporate perspective, particularly a consulting perspective, that existed, at least that I could find. So I was walking along Lincoln Road one day in South Beach, and some gentleman comes up to me and says, hey, hey, can I bother you for a second? I said, sure. And he said, hey, have you ever done any modeling? And at first, I thought he was joking. For sure, I thought he was joking, or he's going to robbed me. I didn't know what was going on, but it felt like it was just, you know, a mismatch. And he said, um, I said, no, never have. And I can't imagine doing that. And he said, well, here's the card. And if you ever are interested, uh, we'd love to, you to stop down the agency and we'll get you set up. So a few more weeks went by and I still realized I couldn't find a job and I'm starting to run out of money. So I was walking along Lincoln road or somewhere in that area again, and somebody else approached me and basically made the same offer a different agency. So at this point, I thought, well, I got to do something. So I went to the agency, uh, the first one, uh, because I felt that was the right thing to do. And I began a modeling career for about 10 years. And some of that um, ended up being a lot of acting work. I did a show on um, UPN or CW called uh, South Beach. Um, but in, the whole, in that experience, as I was doing that, I was mostly becoming increasingly obsessed with happiness and the science of happiness. I later discovered the Masters of Applied Positive Psychology program at Penn. And I matriculated into that program, graduated, set up my private practice, wrote my first book. And then in the experience of all this happening, you know, because I was working in the entertainment field and had friends in entertainment, I was becoming um, more and more referred out or referred to uh, as a love coach or a dating coach and a celebrity love and dating coach because a lot of the friends and folks that I knew in that space were celebrities. Um, so before long, you know, I was getting hit up by TV shows. So I remember getting you know, a call from... Uh, someone at E uh, Television, 
Um, and they said, hey, we're doing this show. It's called Famously Single. Are you interested in doing it? And at first I said, no, I'm really not. It's not really my thing. I just want to help people. And um, they said, listen, that's what you get to do. You get to just be yourself. You can help people and we'll tape whatever makes sense for us. And so, uh, yeah. And then after two seasons there, I did the um, Mind Your Business. It was a show called Mind Your Business on, on the own network, which you mentioned earlier. And so things just kind of kept seemingly falling into my lap out of thin air, but I was working very hard at just trying to be happy myself. That was the primary goal. And the career stuff, professional stuff sort of sorted itself out as I continued doing that. And that doesn't mean that I didn't suffer it. I suffered it a lot. Like I have no idea what I'm gonna do with my life. But the more I focused on just being happy, the more I found that everything else around me began to become more and more clear. I wanna move into the lightning round. And in the lightning round of the show, I'm going to make a statement that you've said somewhere on one of the interviews. I kept rewinding, like, wait, what did he just say? Because there were so many mic drops and things I hadn't heard before. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a voracious learner and reader like you. I mean, Michael Shinger, Eckhart Tolle, like there's a whole, there's a whole list. I mean, we've, I, I think if we compared notes, we'd have a lot in common, but here we go. Lightning round. You said on one interview that happiness equals C plus S plus V. Yes. Tell us about that. Yeah. So um, C is conditions and circumstances of our lives. When we think about success, that's usually what we think about. Health and money and relationships and number of kids and all that stuff. Um, believe it or not, um, that altogether only accounts for 10% of how happy or unhappy are, we are. And I would say that's a very liberal estimate, okay? So, but we're gonna call it 10%. Um, S is genetic set point. So we're all born wired a little higher, a little lower for happiness, okay? And so I was always convinced I was lower, uh, sort of wired for no happiness at all, because <laughs> I was so depressed. And um, believe it or not, genetic set point accounts for about 50% of how happy or unhappy you are. Now, that being said, that 50% is perfectly malleable. It's plastic. It's changeable. It's not like height, right? It's not like eye color. Uh, it's something that uh, you can change. It's plastic. And then uh, finally, there's the V, which is the most important piece of all. Those are volitional or voluntary activities. And that those activities, things we think of like gratitude and optimism or um, you know, explanatory style, grit and social support, these are perfectly controllable. And they influence those other two variables, right? And so really when you think about it, 50% malleable genetic set point, um, you know, 40% volitional activities or voluntary activities, that's 90% perfectly controllable. And then I would argue that the final 10% successful conditions and circumstances also changeable and controllable based on the volitional activities that you participate in or that you practice, right? So I'd say that ultimately happiness is 100% uh, within your control. And that doesn't mean that you should always or need to always be happy by any extent. Um, and the way I often talk about happiness or always talk about happiness really is more an experience of peaceful aliveness and less, you know, rainbows and puppies and ice cream cones all the time. Happiness is the master key to success. Yeah. So the happier you are, the more successful you become a large extent. Now it is a bit of a bell curve. So at some point you become so happy that you're not interested in chasing stuff or pursuing stuff anymore. You're good. So happy people live six to seven years longer than unhappy people. They make 600 to $700,000 more on average over the course of their entire lifetime than their unhappy counterparts. They get married earlier, stay married longer and happier in all the relationships, whether they're married or not, because it doesn't have to do with marriage, it has to do with love and happiness. They experience less job burnout. They are more charitable and generous and kind, meaning they donate more time, energy, blood to other individuals and social causes that they believe in. Um, also, by the way, doing that increases their happiness. They're also rated as more attractive, right? So people will rate those folks who have a Duchenne smile, a smile that you cannot fake. It activates like 300 muscles. They rate those folks as more attractive physically than the folks that don't or aren't you know, um, holding a douche and smile. So in every way, um, happiness increases the likelihood probability of success in your life. And it does so in all areas of your life, 
Um, and so it's important to remember that happiness uh, leads to success and not vice versa. Micro meditation. Yeah, it's one breath that you treat as though it's the last breath you ever take. And so the simple and single goal is to enjoy one breath in through the nose, let the stomach expand more than it normally would, and out of the nose, let the stomach contract more than it normally would. You let all your thoughts go, and your only goal is to enjoy that breath as deeply as humanly possible, like it's your last breath. And the idea is to do that as often as you can throughout the day, no matter what else you're doing, you have to stop what you're doing in order to practice the micro meditation. But the idea is enjoy more conscious breath for their own sake. And you'd be surprised that within about 22 to 66 days, you rewire your brain for a much more peaceful, loving, and joyful experience of life. Oh, it's a game changer. It's already changed my game. I'm doing it multiple times a day. It's so great. Oh, so God. great. Next in the lightning round, over trying gets in the way of being charismatic. Yeah. So the one thing we could say about very charismatic people is that our experience of them and our experience of ourselves when we're charismatic is that it's a kind of unconditional confidence that feels a little bit like soft or divine indifference. And so it's a, it's a, it's a non-needy, non-greedy, non-desperate energy that we feel deeply on the inside. And the most charismatic people don't feel that way only when things are going well or only when they're getting attention from others. They just kind of feel that way about themselves quite consistently, right? And so a presence is another way to talk about it when you're tapped into and turned on to your own I am presence. In other words, you're not focusing on what you're aware of, but just the fact that you are aware, right? You just focus on the fact that, that I am aware that I do exist, end of story, not a lot of discursive thought, not a lot of an analytical thought. That already exudes charisma, right? Already communicates charisma. And so everybody is naturally charismatic. And the only thing that gets in the way of that is trying to be charismatic, which often shows up in the form of overthinking. There's another game changer for me. I've been efforting, efforting to be charismatic. Yeah, it's a, it's a fluid, free-flowing experience that happens automatically and easily and effortlessly when you let go. Here's another thing you said. You said, the brain is good at survival, but not so great at happiness. Yeah, so the brain is designed to keep you alive. <laughs> And it does it extraordinarily well. And not all of the software is up to date, right? Um, a lot of the software is a little outdated. And so we sometimes respond as though we're still living in cave people days. And so, and that's okay. And so the brain, and that being said, that when the brain does its job, and it does its job extraordinarily well, keeps us alive, the likelihood and the opportunity for being happy in these physical bodies goes up exponentially, right? So the brain is an incredibly beautiful and powerful problem-solving instrument. And it's just as good, if not even better, a problem maker, a troublemaker, right? Uh, it can often get in the way of you experiencing happiness. And that's not to say that um, the dozens of cognitive biases that exist in the brain are there only for survival. There's quite a few actually that are there to maintain self-esteem, that are made, uh, meant to reduce cognitive dissonance, so that you can have more peace in your life. And so, um, you know, the statement I make there um, can sound a little exaggerated um, when I um, think about it. Um, but the point I think is clear, which is that you won't find happiness in your head. It's a good start, but you won't find it there. Last in the lightning round, your assertion that it's a mistake to put happiness outside of you and in the future. Yeah, the same. Um, hesitating, procrastinating, postponing mindset that projects happiness into the future now, you will take with you into the future and continue to project it out ahead of you again. Or in other words, if you think happiness exists in the world, in other people or in other places, when you finally get to those other people, other places in that future time period, 
you'll do the same thing again. You'll continue to project it out ahead of you over and over and over again, or outside of you over and over and over again. And the challenge with that too is that the more you do it, the more you want to do it. It's like the person who has uh, some money and they're convinced that they can just make more money, they'll finally be happy. But then they get more money and then they assume that, well, maybe I just didn't quite quite enough, right? So you, if you're going or faced in the wrong direction or you're going in the wrong direction, increasing your speed and momentum will not help, right? Uh, you've got to turn around and head back in the other direction. You just can't get there from there. Uh, so yeah, that's the point of that particular expression. What is next for Robert Mack? What are you working on? It's a great question. Uh, I'm always working on something, but I'm always aware, aware of what I'm working on, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I feel that just by living life, we're all working on something. Um, I do have, uh, I think, eight or nine books that I've written. They're mostly efforts to capture in very brief little phrases or sutras or meditations, entire teachings, right? So that with three words or five words or two sentences, you can get an entire teaching or the entire teaching. And so I've got eight or nine, I've got four books like that or five books like that and four books that are longer form uh, books. I've got a media project or two and uh, lots more talks. And ultimately it's always about happiness and, and, and peace and love and self-love, um, which eventuates into success, traditional forms of success. But that's what's next uh, for me. Above and beyond all that is just to continue to show up as joyfully and lovingly and peacefully present as possible. Honestly, that's probably the highest goal that I have. What's next for Robert and Ivan? Oh my goodness, great question. Whatever you want to be next, right? I mean, Ivan, you fascinate me, my friend. You inspire me, you impress me and, and with all sincerity. I mean, I'm blown away by how phenomenal a listener you are phenomenal interviewer you are. The way in which you hold space, the way in which you reflect back the other person's wisdom or beauty or light and how deep and wise you truly are. And so um, I would say whatever we want it to be, Ivan. So uh, whatever we want it to be. I came into podcasting as a way to promote my book. And started and did my first hundred episodes, just me talking to the camera, which I'm going to surface some of those. I'm going to bring them back, but it's me trying to impress like, oh, I'm a conversations expert. And I'm only a conversations expert in the definition of Niels Bohr, the physicist, that I've made a lot of mistakes in a very narrow field. Right? <laughs> I love that. Same. Um, and I've created a framework and a methodology for having conversations as a relationship manager, and I use it as a podcaster. That's how I started. But I didn't like that in terms of there's no energy, there's no synergy. And so as I've evolved, having guests and meeting amazing people, collaboration is the name of the game. So I don't have the answer either, but I want to, I want to collaborate with you. I want to be happy hundred percent of the time. But I want to give that away to others because I realize that I will be more happy. I'll be happier by collaborating. Another insight I got is you can have tens of thousands of views on social media, on YouTube, on podcast platforms, and not have a single conversation with somebody. And I kept waiting for the conversations with the people out there, which I want to have. Then it hit me. The guests are the community. They are the place and we're having the conversation for you and I, although it will benefit countless numbers of people over time because it's evergreen content and this will be helpful to people in the year 2070. Mm. And it never goes away. So anyway, so collaboration is what I want to create with you. Well, I'm committed. I love it. Let's do that. Um, I just want to reflect back to your wisdom there. It's just so profound because it's- still Okay, so good. Which is like, you're absolutely right that like, you know, fame, called fame popularity, getting likes, like fear is like a mile wide, but an inch deep. 
know, it's paper thin, right? And that doesn't mean that you always have to trade width or breadth for depth, right? You don't have to always trade it. It's like you can, some, there, there are, Eckhart Tolle is a great example, for example. Rupert Spear is a great example. Uh, Joe Dispenza could be a great example. Abraham Hicks, you know, they go extraordinarily deep and they also have lots and lots and lots of followers and fans and folks that love their work. Maybe they call them friends, right? Um, but to your point, I love the focus on quality conversations with quality people and creating a community and that community being the guest on the show. And I'm uh, so honored to be one of those guests and I'm so looking forward to continuing the conversation and working towards some kind of collaborative endeavor um, that is starting right here and right now. Awesome. As part of your closing statement, what do you want the people who are listening to this that aren't you and I to do as a result of this conversation we just had? Yeah. Spend more time enjoying your own presence, right? Um, that doesn't mean thinking. That doesn't mean you have to do a whole lot. It doesn't mean you have to do anything differently. It doesn't mean that you have to fight thoughts. It doesn't mean you have to get rid of thoughts. It just means more and more, notice that you exist. Just full stop. Practice the micro meditations. That'll help get you there. But there's a peaceful aliveness that exists within all of us, right here and right now. And it exists there all the time, no matter what you are or aren't thinking or are or aren't doing or do or don't have. It's always there. You can tap into it or become aware of it anytime you want. And so spend more time just feeling in to the peaceful aliveness that exists within your body. Another word for the peaceful aliveness is stillness or silence. But that stillness dances and that silence sings, it shouts. And the more time you spend communing with it or feeling into it, the louder it will get and the more palpable and visceral and alive that peacefulness and that happiness and that love will become inside of you. It's like a dimmer switch. You just continue turning up, but it turns itself up uh, without your effort at all at some point. Well, my closing statement as we bring this conversation to a close is you've changed my life. I'm already happier and I'm really delighted to have you be the latest new member of the conversations community on YouTube. My handle is conversation leaders. And so you go to youtube.com forward slash at conversation leaders. And as my vision is evolving, imagine a group of conversation leaders who are making such a huge difference. And my vision has always been, there's a, there's a couple of parts to my vision as I'm making an extended closing statement here. We don't teach conversations in schools and we need to. And my, my bucket list endeavor is to create conversations university because not only should we teach it K through 12, but have a full four-year university. So I saw your, I saw the light bulb go over. You want to join my endeavor? The Dean of Happiness, bring yes. it on. Yes, I love this. You're absolutely spot on, my friend. I love it. Yes. Let's talk about this. All right. So that's that's one. That's, But also, I feel like everybody's got a conversation inside of them, and we live so small and unemboldened. So also, when I shifted from, hey, I'm this big expert, to let me hold space and elevate the people as my guests, which I've now done for about 80 guests where I've just like, it's all about you. Like you are, I want to embolden and, in, and enlighten and lift up people in their conversations. And that's why when I started this, actually the first time I started that way to define a conversation leader. You have done that. I just did. Oh, well. Yeah. Now, I mean, I yeah. feel enlightened. I feel emboldened. I feel inspired and I feel uplifted. Well, good, because you're already pretty high up on that uh, that mountain towards the Oracle. So Yeah, I, I liked it there. I tried being down there in the valley. It didn't work for me. <laughs> well, as a thank you for being on the podcast, I'm going to send you a copy of my book. And uh, the book is a manual for anyone who wants to optimize business and personal relationships through effective conversations. It's 
it's a framework and a process that kind of brings the extroverts down to earth and get, makes it scientific. But then for the introverts of the world, it gives them a framework and a process so they can be a little bit more comfortable in a world that can be uncomfortable. Mm. Now, lastly, to the person listening to my words right now, that's not you or me, I invite you to join this community, this conversation leaders community. We want to get like-minded professionals together, but more importantly, that you out there, let me know that conversations are important. They're meaningful. They're, you want to be more effective because I do think my book, and there's lots of information out there to be more effective, but whether you identify as a conversation leader or not, you are one, and I encourage you to really embrace it. My door is open if I can be a service to you as a coach, if I can speak at your organization. I love to have that opportunity to contribute and be helpful. Connect with me on LinkedIn or contact me by email at ivan at conversations.biz. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to the podcast, youtube.com forward slash at conversation leaders. With that, Robert Mack, coachrobmack.com, and everybody out there, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being a part of this conversation about conversations. It shivers the entire time, you know. Did you? Yes, and it's hot in here. Okay, <laughs> it's Miami and it's hot. Your sincerity and your authenticity. I mean, I really mean this. I mean, like, just like you, a voracious reader. Also, ten solid years of doing interviews, and one of the best interviews. I mean, one of the best because of the way in which you show up. Really, I mean that. It allows things to come through that can't or haven't come through any other place, right? Or couldn't come through in any other space. So really well done. Um, I feel so honored and I do want to collaborate with you. You know, let's um, think about that, talk about it. And if thoughts or ideas occur to you, let me know. This Dean of Happiness thing sounds amazing. Loving that. But anything you're feeling inspired around, I'd love to hear about and love to, you know, work with you on.